People spread out from the plant in all directions. I had a lot of concern that there were people who could have been hurt or needing help and trapped in that inferno. The true spirit of a community can most often be measured during a disaster. An unexpected crisis can bring people closer together and remind them of what is truly important in life, family and friends. That's what happened in Henderson, Nevada on May 4th, 1988, when a fire in a chemical plant caused a series of violent explosions. These blasts were so powerful that you'll actually see the shock waves as they move through the air. Our story begins when Dennis Todd, an engineer, arrives on his job five miles from that same chemical plant with, as luck would have it, his video camera. That camera and others would capture the terrifying moments of that day and the personal stories of a community under fire. May 4th, 1988, I'd been contracted to do routine maintenance work on a TV transmit facility on Black Mountain in Henderson, Nevada. I carry a video camera with me to videotape certain processes that go on during my work. While working on the mountaintop, one of my employees noticed that there was this fire producing quite dense black smoke below us. Look at that flame spread, will you? And an engineer from one of the other television stations came over, and he mentioned that that was Pepcom, and it was a rocket fuel plant. What did they make there, Chuck? Oh. It's, a, it's a solid propellant for rockets. Oh, my God. I was dumbfounded at the speed at which this material was burning and spreading and the brilliance of this flame, unlike a, a flame I had never seen before. Did you call somebody? Yeah, fire department. We're taught to notice the color of the fires because it'll tell you a great deal about what's burning. The colors were a, a really a, a weird orange, brown, gray color, and that's not normal in a building fire. I worked for Pepcon for about seven years prior to the fire, and I was, was there the day it happened. I think my biggest concern at that point in time was trying to make sure that we got people out. I could see that toxic cloud, and that, that really bothered me because the cloud was blowing basically right toward us. We were going to have to kind of enter the cloud to get to where we had to go. I told my driver to stop probably 1,200 feet from the plant. And, and I'm standing next to the ambulance. I'm putting on my air pack. The first explosion came and blew me into the ambulance. Oh! I turned around and saw the first explosion, and it Boy, took eight or nine it. seconds before the shockwave got to us, and it was very loud. The business we owned, the gravel plant, was probably 1,500 to 2,000 feet from uh, Pepcon. Sounded just like a bomb that went off right next to us. I was sure that somebody was going to be seriously injured and perhaps killed. I know what the Japanese felt like in Hiroshima. It was that intense. I was probably a quarter of a mile from, from the blast site. But I remember looking over my shoulder and seeing my office just annihilated and running in the office, looking down the hallway and seeing my wife covered with glass. That was our cue that we better get the heck out of there. Oh, there's another one. There were two or three more smaller explosions which we could barely hear the, the boom from. After the flames had uh, subsided and all we could see was smoke coming out, I felt, well, this must have been the end of it, that everything that was going to explode had exploded. And as, as we stopped and got out of the rig again and, and started to put on our, our air packs again, the big explosion came. And I mean, this thing was huge.
that one picked me up and blew me through the air some distance, I don't know, maybe 30, 40 feet. I was never exactly sure where I started or exactly where I finished up. The blast took both of my eardrums out and ruptured them and filled my ear canals with sand and gravel. I looked up, there was the most horrible rain of stuff coming down out of the sky. Rocks, pieces of metal. I thought uh, probably something would hit me and there was a good chance that it would kill me. Everything disappeared. Radio traffic went dead. And I thought, my God, we've lost everybody. You could see this shockwave coming across the ground at you. I kept waiting for arms and legs and these bodies to come flying through the air at me. Well, there were things flying through the air at me, but it wasn't bodies. I could see, even in the viewfinder of the camera, the shockwave traveling across the desert floor. I had been looking at the marshmallow plant, and as this explosion occurred, the shockwaves rippled the roof on the building. The building was being destroyed in front of my eyes. You're sitting here watching this giant shockwave coming toward you, and you think, what the heck do we do now? It was just awesome. Of course, I was looking through the camera, and I didn't realize what was happening. To have a shockwave hit you like that, it's uh, kind of like just standing out in the middle of the road and having the car hit you, but it doesn't hit you in one place, just all over. It uh, almost lifts you off the ground and spins you around and drops you on the ground, and you sit there wondering what has happened. There was no doubt in my mind that those people had died, but they didn't. They just ran through the desert, and this is what they were doing. They were running through the desert. So that was a relief to me, that you see people coming out, and they're still alive, they're still functioning, and they're not just blown to bits. The ambulances were coming back and forth and taking the people that were hurt the worst up to the hospital first. There were lines set up outside the hospital. It was mass confusion and mass chaos. Our power uh, was out. Our communication systems were out. Most of the windows and glass in the hospital had been blown out. And at the same time, we were needing to respond to hundreds of people that were just streaming in from the community. We're going to Jenny's. It's just up the street. She needs to know that Red is OK. Actually, it was being run very well. We had the nurses, the doctors, everybody was out on the front lawn or, or the front of the hospital waiting for the patients to come in. Uh -huh. <laughs> I think probably a lot of people had concussion injuries. Kind of scratches, bruises, maybe broken arms and bleeding uh, eardrums, noses, and things like that. I was amazed at the amount of damage the further I drove in to the community as I drove into my neighborhood, there's no cars, there's no kids, there's no nothing. That scared me. And I'm going, where's my family? What's happened to my family? The big explosion registered 3.5 on the Richter scale. I mean, it shook the whole valley. And of course, people look out here and see this giant cloud, and they thought everything from a 747's gone down, we've been attacked by terrorists, that's an atomic bomb explosion, because that's what it looked like. They were all in a state of uh, terror. Okay, everything's okay. My son describing it that was at a junior high, probably a mile away from the blast site. The teacher that was standing by him uh, had to chase him down because he kept screaming, my dad's dead, my dad's dead, my dad's dead. I finally had to commandeer a newscaster's portable telephone to call our families and tell them we're alive. Nobody knows. My family was also able to call me, say, Dad, we're safe. And uh, I look back on that, and my family's never hugged. They've never... They've never touched like we did that day. I continued to shoot the aftermath of the explosion, and I began to see the results of this explosion even more. It was a very eerie feeling. The twisted steel of the buildings, the debris all over the road, are getting quite a bit of radiation heat from the burning gas and a very eerie feeling that nobody's around.
I saw some of the cars that were in the parking lot, and the explosions picked those cars up and tossed them around just like toys. The main office of the gravel plant, it actually moved the whole building off the foundation. The explosion just did what it wanted to do. It didn't slow down for anyone. Probably a miracle of the year that only two people were fatally injured. Thank God we didn't lose more people than we did. We were very lucky that day. I think if God hadn't been with us that day, we'd have lost a bunch of people. I can close my eyes right now and still picture the fireball that I saw in the last big explosion. There are a multitude of reasons that I don't think I could forget May 4th, 1988 if I wanted to.